invited him at the last minute. He graciously accepted it and I'm very thankful to him for coming all over from India and be among us and share his thoughts and his observation, especially which he saw, which we did not. So I invite Asaduddin Awaisi Sahib. Please give him the warm welcome. My dear brothers and sisters, I am thankful to Jarab Mansur Hori Sahab for inviting me. Uh, since you have spoken to me on uh, 21st, 22nd of August, and uh, you want me to come and attend this uh, August gathering. I'm thankful to Mandur Boris for inviting me and the reason I'm, I'm over here is I have no political purpose. I'm only here to tell the world what is happening in Assam. Because this thing has to be told in a very blunt and in a bold way. And the time which I have been given uh, uh, to address you, I just want to divide into two parts. One is the argument that is being that is being given in Assam is that majority of the Muslims living in Assam are not Indian citizens, they are Bangladeshis. This allegation has to be destroyed completely by historical facts. And the historical facts are that Muslims were the second community which came to Assam. This was way back in, in 1206 AD. At that time, Assam was not called Assam, it was called Kamru. And the first Muslims who came to Assam were uh, one of the generals of Muhammad Ghori called Muhammad bin Bakhtiyar Khilji. And then we had another second wave of Muslims entering Assam uh, by, I'm sure the Hyderabadi people know, Mir Jumla, General of Aurangzeb came to Assam. And then we had the third migration of Muslims into Assam when British annexed uh, Assam from Bhutan under what is called the Treaty of Yandabu in 1826. So Muslims have been living in Assam from 1206 AD. The Muslim rulers went over there and the Awliya Allah had gone to Assam. They married over there and through them Islam spread over there. And as of now, in Assam, you have, according to the last census of government of India, which we call a 2001 census, we have nearly 32% of Muslims live in Assam. So that is a very, very huge number. Now, what is happening over there is that this is, this is the present humanitarian crisis is such a huge that independent India has never seen such a crisis. You have 500,000 Muslims who have been displaced by a conniving state government over there and a biased police force over there. And since last one month, more than one month, 500,000 Muslims are living in temporary relief camps. Now, according, before I just proceed, I just want to bring to your notice is that on 12th of March, this year, the Planning Commission of India had, had come out with uh, the poverty figures in India. And I am not surprised when they said that the, 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 the highest number of poor people are amongst the Muslims. And in Assam, and, and, and the definition of poverty in India is a person who can manage his or her life with 32 rupees. That is uh, around about what uh, 64 cents and I was told by my friend that you can buy a coke can and 50 cents over here in Assam in rural Assam you have 53.6 percent of Muslims who are living below the poverty line that is they are not able to earn 50 64 cents a day and 
with this huge amount of displacement, you can wherever imagine uh, the problems which are there, which, which, which they will be facing over there. When this thing happened in Assam, this, this is not the first time it has happened over there. In 1951, 600,000 Muslims were displaced when India and Pakistan came into existence. After the Nehru Liakhat back, these 600,000 Muslims came back to Assam, the lower Assam. In 61, the then government had forcibly picked up 300,000 Muslims and left them at the border, saying that you are not Indians. Later on, after a lot of persuasion, some of them could come back, some, some of them just stayed back over there. The fourth issue is that you have According to a report which came out 10 years ago, that nearly 2 million Muslims live on what we call in Assam, Chor Islands. These are uh, tributaries of, of, of uh, you know, there's immense land over there within the river. Uh, and over there, you have 2 million Muslims who have been living over there, according to this ten, uh, report which came out 10 years ago. There's a huge erosion of land which happens over there every year. And the Muslims living on these Chor Islands, they come to the mainland. And the assumption is that, no, these are all Bangladeshis. The fifth point is that the state of Assam shares two districts with Bangladesh. The state of Meghalaya shares nearly five districts. And if you see the recent uh, provisional census list which is out right now, the decadal growth is much higher in those districts of Meghalaya which borders Bangladesh rather than Assam. Yes, Dubri is a district which borders Bangladesh, which borders Bangladesh, which has a huge population of Muslims, nearly 75%. But the surprising fact is that these 75% Muslims, you will not find a single Bengali government high school over there. All of them are asked to learn have adopted Assami culture and they speak Assami language, they don't speak, they don't uh, go to Bengali schools. The seventh point is that this whole issue, why it has erupted now, is that what we say in Urdu, that Lamho ne khata ki sadiyo ne sada bai. We were not alive to the situation which was happening over there and, and as a result, in 2003, the government of India had signed an agreement with the Bodos, who are the main perpetrators of the displacement of nearly 500,000 Muslims, they were given administrative powers to run that particular area. And because they are in, uh, in, the administrative powers are in few people, are in the hands of few people, and the Bodos compromise only 29% of that Bodo land. The remaining 80%, out of the 80%, 75% are Muslims. So this is a well-targeted ethnic cleansing of Muslims over there. And only Muslims have been targeted in Assam. And Mr. Manzur Ghori was telling me that in 1983, the Nelly massacre took place. The Nelly government of India says only 1,600 Muslims were killed, but the actual figure is more than 8,000 Muslims were slaughtered in a matter of few hours. And not a single person was convicted because of Nelly massacre. All the FIRs and charge sheets were taken back in 1985 when the then Assam Ganar Parishad uh, party came into power. So this time we have to ensure that the FIRs are registered and I am extremely happy to say that Jara Mandur Gori Sahib was telling me that IMRC has tied up a Center for Social Justice uh, and they have assured them that 80,000 first information reports will be registered and IMRC has given uh, Center for Social Justice 20,000 US dollars in the first phase to start the legal battle. I am extremely grateful. And Mandur Borisa, let me assure you that from my side, Inshallah, you know, our party will also contribute in ensuring that those 80,000 FIRs are registered. What I have seen in Assam is, I have, I have gone there twice, I have spent nearly uh, seven days in Assam. 
I have never seen such back murders in my life. I had also been to Gujarat in 2002 when the communal riots took place over there. And as an Indian, I, I thought that this is the last time I am going to see ethnic cleansing or genocide of Muslims or a program of Muslims. But it is to my misfortune that I am alive to see another genocide, another massacre of Muslims. What the figures which have been given by the government are absolutely wrong and rubbish. They say that 91 Muslims have been killed so far. I know for a fact that more than 700 Muslims have been killed over there. Because the, the geographical area is such that you find water everywhere. Now bodies are slowly emerging. And 95% 90, 90, of these people, Muslims who have been killed have been shot dead by automatic weapons. They were not killed by any sword or, or, or the dagger, which is the, is the usual course of killing Muslims in communal rights. These borders, they were militant organizations uh, organization before. They signed a treaty with the government of India, but not a single automatic weapon was surrendered by the ex-militant organization. They have more than 1,000 AK-47 with them. And they have massacred Muslims over there. And you will know very soon that when these bodies will, will come out, because nobody has yet gone into interior areas. Once you go into interior areas, you will find more than 700 Muslims have been uh, brutally killed. But people who have gone to the interior areas have told me that this is the exact figure. What you and me can do in Assam, this is very important because you just imagine 500,000 Muslims living in uh, temporary relief camps. I can give you an example of, of a school which I went in Pokhraja, which is, which is where the real trouble happened. In this school in Pokhraja, this school can accommodate only 700 students. Over there, you have 7,500 people living over there. And I took a team of doctors uh, uh, with me. We were there for nearly four hours. And out of the 7,500 uh, people who are living over there, you have 1,800 children who are severely sick. And according to the doctors who are there with me, you know, there were some pediatric uh, uh, good expert uh, doctors who told me that if proper medical relief is not given to these children, these relief camps will turn into death camps. The government over there is giving an antibiotic course. I'm not a doctor, maybe I stand to be corrected. Antibiotic course has to be given for four days or five days. I have seen with my eyes that antibiotic tablets are being given for only one day. Thereby, you know, the whole body becomes immune. They can't be treated again now. And now I know yesterday that I was told by, by my friend when I spoke to him over there that children have started to die in these camps. And just imagine, I, I mean, you, all of us, alhamdulillah, are fine over here. Like, God forbid that tomorrow you and me are, you know, told to live in a relief camp. We carry our children and our children are suffering, have no medicine over there. I have seen women who have told me that the last time they got a, a, a you know, they showered, they had a wash was 15 days ago. They, have, they ran away with one clothes. I have seen people walk Mr. Manzoor Ghori through, uh, through uh, the Honorable MP over there, uh, Mr. Badruddin Ajumar's organization, uh, Marcus, you have given them some $50,000 uh, and they had purchased some clothes. I have seen with my eyes that when, when these women were coming and taking the sari which was being given to them, they were covering their faces. And I didn't realize why they were covering their faces and I kept noticing. Then after this function was over, I went to a lady and asked her, that, you know, uh, I asked someone why are these women covering and you know, putting their hands, is it all because they said, no, sir, the reason is that you have seen some 30 families over here. They used to own 15, 30 acres of land. They used to own 50, 30 acres of land and they used to 
give people whatever they want within the village over there and now they are forced to beg and, 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 and take clothes from the people. And I have seen people over there uh, who have told me that this Ramadan we used to take, uh, we used to give zakat of, we used to take out zakat of lakhs of rupees. Now we are forced to ask for zakat from people. So this is not limited to one or two families. You know, they were quite well off. It's a very fertile area and they used to get two crops of over there. And a deliberate targeting has been done over there. So this is a huge humanitarian crisis. And that is why Prime Minister Manmohan Singh had called it a blot on our nation. Which I, which I would like to say that it is an understatement. It is a crisis is huge. And if Muslims of India and Muslims of the world don't come to the rescue, I feel we will be doing a grave injustice to ourselves. Because they, they are looking towards all of us. And even now, even now as I tell you, killings are taking place. There is no end, no stopping to this killings by this Bodo militants. These are militant organizations which are still banned by all international governments, which are on the banned list of the United Nations. But it is the most unfortunate part is that the state government is not willing to disarm them. And now these, the Bodos are saying that we will only allow those Muslims who have revenue records. Can you please imagine that people whose every household attitude has been burned? He has no proof, any documentary proof are, is being told that you produce a proof. How is it that you're going to show that proof that yes, this is, this is the proof I have? They are being stopped from going back to the respective places. And when people come and tell me that no, you are supporting Bangladeshis, it is absolutely nonsense. I, my counter question to these people is that you had killed me in Gujarat. You had made 200,000 Muslims homeless in Gujarat. Was I a Bangladeshi over there? You had targeted me only because I was a proud Muslim. But these people must understand that by killing us, we are not going to finish Islam. Inshallah, by killing us, more more will people will accept Islam. And I am sure that these killers himself will one day become Islam, Inshallah. will accept Islam, Inshallah. Okay. Another important point is when this allegation is made that Muslims of Assam are Bangladeshis. The counter question to that would be when Bangladesh came into existence in 1971. At that time the population of Bangladesh, the Muslims in Bangladesh were 3 crores and the Hindus were on about one, uh, 2 crores. Now the population of Muslims in Bangladesh is four, nearly 14 crores. And the Hindus in Bangladesh are only 1.5 crores. I can understand that the Muslim population growth rate is high. But I, I fail to understand that how is it that the Hindu population is even at 1.5 crores. My opinion is that majority of these people have entered India. It's not the other way around. Because Muslims living in Bangladesh are well out than Muslims living in Assam. This has been proven by empirical data because the area in which they live is not prone to floods in Bangladesh. Though you get flood, but the, the area bordering India is not prone to much of floods and thereby that has helped them over there. And no one wants to answer this question. And BJP and Sang Parivar are utilizing this opportunity. They, they are sensing an opportunity in this humanitarian crisis to polarize the whole of India once again so that they can reap electoral benefits. And that is why LK Advani, the BJP leaders, RSS, Sun Parivar are saying that this is a fight between Bangladeshis and Indians. This is absolutely wrong. These people are proud Indians. Through generations they have lived over there. Just because they speak Bengali language does not make them a Bangladeshi. If this argument is accepted, then one has to say that Manmohan Singh, because he has come from Pakistan and Adwani who has come from Karachi because his language is Sindhi and his language is Punjabi, they stand to become Pakistani then. This argument cannot be taken. I am, this, this is the worst kind of allegation which can be given to any Muslim that you are a Bangladesh. I am not against Bangladesh, but I am a proud Indian. 
and that is what is happening and and the downside to this is i fear i have said this in parliament that if rehabilitation does not take place in a proper way then india should be ready for a third wave of radicalization you what we are seeing now is that the youths in these camps which we went to in 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 many of the camps they used to allow us to enter in the camp they said no don't come go away from here when we question them and ask them why is it that you are stopping as you know we have come all the way from hyderabad this is month of ramadan you know, you have 45 degrees of temperature over here we are fasting let us do our work they they are telling us that we don't want this tamasha we don't want your medicines if you want to help us give us weapons we want to go and live in our place we want to fight this terrorists now how would you stop these youths from becoming radicalized and tomorrow god forbid if these youths you know they lose confidence in the indian parliament of democracy and adopt a militant attitude it's again a huge problem to muslim community because it is very easy to call a muslim a terrorist in india and to put him behind bars or to shoot him in an encounter so the muslim community leaders are facing a two prong problem one is to rehabilitate them second to ensure that these muslim youths do on don't go on that path where they, they pick up arms and and, and 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 in this way that they become a huge problem for the whole community and the nation in particular so this has to be looked into and i i am extremely thankful to uh, mansur bhai sahab that he has taken up this task of of providing uh, mosquito nets and rehabilitation you know i just i i don't know how to put it in words because the crisis is very huge very severe and and you know people how how do you go and explain to women who come and tell you that what what sort of arrangement you have for our hygiene and the, the way of the, the hygiene is very different as compared to urban areas how do you go and explain to to to, to elders who are living in those camps who come and ask us that okay you have held a medical camp you have given something what will happen do i go back to my village or do or i am i am going to stay here for the next rest of my life so these are important questions which i am sure that imrc and other organizations who are here based in us can use this opportunity bring it and the first thing that has to be done is to let the whole world know that this is a great humanitarian crisis we cannot keep quiet on that these are poor muslims who have nothing to go back to and unless and until the muslims come forward to really help them in whatever way you can you know this the rehabilitation will not will not start will not happen and the state government over there is hand in glove with the militants who are living over there it is a huge huge crisis i guess i i i i don't know how to put it to you you know but there are no medicine is there no clean water is there you know children are even dying because of drinking uh, unclean water we have taken some chlorine tablets with us which is which is not enough at all so i, I hope that imrc will will take up this and from my party mandis ittehad ul muslimin we have uh, allocated 100000 1.25 crore which is i don't know this which comes to around about 100000 plus dollars and uh, uh, what what uh, what uh, 200000 dollars and you know we are we are doing some work over there you know but it is it, it is a still a drop in an ocean because the crisis is huge and if you go to these camps it reminds you that are you in a war territory you see you see burnt out villages you see charred huts as if some sort of you know invading army had come over here or maybe you know i have read about genghis khan has just swept whole of assam and destroyed everything in his path this is what we have seen in assam i am not exaggerating in a life of it i have seen whatever i have seen i have told it in the indian parliament i have told it to the media i am bringing it to your notice you know the the least you can do is at least please be thankful to allah subhanahu wa taala that me and you are not in that situation the best we can do is to pray for these people because i believe that once we lift our hands like on rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam this is the weapon which we have so we have to use this weapon 
to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on these Muslims of Assam and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the tawfiq that we should come forward and, and help these Muslims and then I conclude by saying that uh, the reminder of uh, a share of Allah Akbar خزا کا دور ہے خزا کا دور ہے لیکن یہ ہمارا ظلم کہتا ہے ہم ان معمال ذروں کو درخشا کر کے چھوڑیں گے واخر الدعوان الحمدللہ